Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dear learners, this video is for the subject of education and the course for which this is prepared is Bachelors in Education. The paper which is covering this particular video is Child Development and Learning. The module or the topic is Behavioral Learning Theories and this particular lecture is covering Pavlov's Learning Theory. The course coordinator for this video is Dr. Iram Khan from Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. The subject matter expert is Professor Jaseem Ahmed from Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. And the academic expert or reviewer for this video is Professor Sara Begum from Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. This particular video is produced under the project DTH Swayam Prabha channels of MHRD, New Delhi. So let us welcome Dr. Jaseem Ahmed for this discussion. Hello dear learners, I am Professor Jaseem Ahmed from IAC Faculty of Education, Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. And the topic of our discussion today is Pavlov's Learning Theory. During this lecture and discussion, we will try to discuss the experiment conducted by Pavlov and his learning theory. He will also discuss the meaning of conditioning and classical conditioning which he has given and we will discuss the role of conditioning in behavior modification or learning um, uh, by the children and by any human being. He will also discuss the implications of Pavlov theory of learning and finally we will try to discuss and deliberate on the critique of Pavlov conditioning theory of learning. Dear friends, we have already discussed about behavioral approach of learning when we discussed on learning as a construction of knowledge in the previous uh, lecture. But still, uh, before we go into the discussion and deliberation on Pavlov's learning theory, it is better to put some light on behavioral learning. As we have already discussed, and you must be aware that behaviorism is primarily concerned with observable behavior as opposed to internal events like thinking and emotions. So behavioral learning basically focuses on learning through modification of behavior, modification in our approach of interacting with one another and through you know, developing a bond between stimulus and response. So it is a kind of habit formation by the learners. There is no importance or place of reasoning, logic, thinking, cognition and other mental process in the behavioral approach of learning because it focuses on the enduring modification of behavior uh, basically is the process of learning. Uh, it focuses on practice and exercise uh, uh, in the process of learning and so the main focus of behavioral approach of learning is uh, basically on uh, putting learners onto the practice, putting learners onto the exercise and repetition and drill and uh, this kind of activity. So uh, only concerned with observable stimulus response behavior. Uh, that that means okay, behavioristic learning uh, concerns with observable stimulus response behavior and states all behaviors are learned through SR bond, through uh, forming association between the stimulus and response and through interaction with the environment. Now uh, we are moving towards uh, uh, Ivan Petrovic Pavlov, IP Pavlov and his uh, theory of learning. Uh, uh, we must uh, know something about Pavlov. Pavlov was basically a Russian psychologist and uh, he is popularly known for his theory of classical conditioning. Pavlov's principles of classical conditioning have been found to operate across a variety of behavior therapies and in experimental and clinical settings. Primarily he was a scientist researching in the area of physiology of digestion, working of saliva, how saliva works and the role of pancreas in the process of digestion. 
His interest in classical conditioning occurred almost by chance during one of his experiments on salivation in dogs. After that, Pavla worked closely with animals throughout many of his experiments. His early contributions were primarily about animal learning. However, the fundamentals of classical, classical conditioning have been examined across many different organisms, including human, as per Tarpey 1975. The basic underlying principles of Pavlov classical conditioning have extended to a variety of settings such as classroom and other learning environments. Now, uh, try to understand what is basically classical conditioning, which is also known as Pavlovian or respondent conditioning. It refers to a learning procedure in which a biologically potent stimulus, for example, food, is paired with a previously neutral stimulus, for example, bell, it refers to the learning process that results from this pairing through which the neutral stimulus comes to elicit a response that is salivation that is usually similar to the one elicited by the potent stimulus, which was food. Pavlov was conducting experiment on salivation in dog in response to being fed, that is, he was doing experiment in the field of physiology of digestion in dogs. And through this experiment, he was trying to infer uh, the physiology of digestion in human being. He, uh, in during his experiment, he inserted a small test tube into the cheek of each dog to measure saliva. When dogs were fed with a powder made from meat, he predicted that the dog would salivate in response to the food placed in front of them. But he noticed that his dogs would begin to salivate as soon as they heard the footstep of his assistant who was bringing them the food. This observation, try to understand, this was basically the observation which developed the interest of Pavlov in behavior modification and learning. You can see in this diagram uh, how uh, this is basically the experimental setup of Pavlov. So this is totally uh, total experimental setup. Pavlov is sitting uh, uh, on other side of the dog, and the dog is being you know put in a situation where uh, he is being controlled uh, indirectly, and uh, the amount of saliva being secreted from his mouth is being measured. How much saliva is being secreted in what circumstances and, uh, and in what situation? So uh, now let's move uh, towards uh, uh, some of the important, um, you know, thing about this experiment. So Pavlov discovered that any object or event which the dogs learn to associate with food, such as the lab assistant foot step, would trigger the same response. He realized that he had made an important scientific discovery. Accordingly, he devoted the rest of his career to studying this type of learning. Classical conditioning occurs when a neutral stimulus is paired with an unconditioned stimulus. Now, first of all, try to understand what is unconditioned stimulus and what is neutral stimulus. But as for example, if we take something in my in, in our mouth, for example, if we take you know pickle in our mouth, or if we see pickle in front of us, automatically you know salivation uh, starts in our mouth, and so our mouth becomes wet just to see the pickle uh, uh, or, 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 or by taking something into our mouth, which is eatable in nature. So this is basically unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned respo response. So whenever you see some, you know, testful thing in front of you or you uh, keep something into your mouth, which is testful, which is eatable, then it, uh, it releases, you know, saliva in our mouth. So this is basically unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned, uh, you know, response. But uh, for example, if you if you see a wax in front of you, and if you see if you keep this this a particular a small piece of wax into your mouth, you will uh, not going to salivate. Uh, so anybody will not be uh, salivating just on looking at the wax or putting a, a piece of wax into its mouth or piece or piece of food into the mouth. So uh, this is basically neutral stimulus because uh, this. Uh, a piece of wood or piece of wax or, 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 or a small stone or a part of brick. These are the things on seeing which or putting something, uh, some of these kinds into our mouth. It doesn't, uh, you know, uh, 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 it doesn't uh, uh, produce salivation in our mouth. So 
these stimulus are basically neutral stimulus because these are not going to produce saliva in our mouth now what 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 uh, uh, pavlov did in conditioning we will be discussing just uh, a moment later and so if this pairing you know pairing of unconditional stimulus with uh, uh, some neutral stimulus is basically the theme of this classical conditioning experiments so if this pairing is repeated yani if you uh, pair some unconditional stimulus with some neutral stimulus for uh, you know repeated uh, time uh, number of times uh, so then a time comes when the uh, neutral stimulus acquires the response of unconditional stimulus so in that situation you know that neutral stimulus becomes conditioned stimulus and the response produced by this conditioned stimulus is known as condition response so let us try to understand if this pairing is repeated several times for several days a time comes when the neutral stimulus acquires the responses of the unconditioned or natural stimulus the whole process is called conditioning after conditioning is established the neutral stimulus is now called as a conditioned stimulus and unconditioned response becomes a conditioned you know response let us try to understand the technical terms pavlov in 1902 started from the idea that there are some things that a dog does not need to learn and so is the case with human being for example we don't learn to salivate whenever we see food we don't learn to salivate whenever we see food because it is a biological instinct it is a kind of reflex the reflex of salivation is hardwired into us as a biological instinct in behaviorist term food is an unconditioned or natural stimulus and salivation is an unconditioned or natural response in other words the stimulus response connection that required no learning instead it is inbuilt or inborn instinct so let us uh, uh, see here the different stages of pavlov experiment uh, uh, as you you can see uh, on the slide that in a stage 1 pavlov uh, uh, has uh, you know uh, shown here that uh, uh, food is the unconditioned stimulus for dog and when the food is presented to the dog uh, the dog salivates so saliva is secreted so this saliva is basically unconditioned response for the unconditioned stimulus that is food so this is a kind this is a kind of reflex and for the for this uh, no learning is required every human being uh, all of us uh, have this kind of salivation whenever we eat some food saliva is there whenever we keep we take bread in our mouth we uh, take a, a slice in our mouth we take some you know favorite uh, things in our mouth we, we when we take some eatables which are our favorite you know which we like and which uh, test to us when when we keep or when we see these things you know salivation uh, salivation is uh, you know uh, uh, produced saliva is produced so this is a kind of reflex action and this is a kind of you know biological instinct and for which no learning is required it is biological in nature so try to understand uh, un unconditioned stimulus produce unconditioned response that is the natural stimulus produce natural uh, response this was this was basically the uh, basically uh, main frame of the experiment of pavlov now uh, the, um, uh, stage 2 you can say here that uh, an, uh, this is neutral stimulus ns for neutral stimulus for example metro norm uh, another example may be bell may be a stone may be wood uh, may be chalk you know uh, anything which is uh, not eatable for dog or for all of us you know uh, anything which cannot produce saliva in the uh, in, in in our in our you know mouth so the the neutral stimulus there is no response at all so this is another thing now what uh, uh, pavlov uh, done at third stage is that he combined stage 1 and stage 2 together so he gave dog food and at the same time uh, bell was rung at the same time and and there was a response of salivation so here in in stage 3 unconditioned stimulus that is food and uh, neutral stimulus that is bell was put together placed together placed at the same time and the result was seen that unconditioned response was there and uh, uh, this unconditioned response that is the saliva secretion must be because of the first stage that is because of the presence of food but here uh, you can see that food and bell are you know put together 
they are being placed at the same time and saliva secretion is being observed and this was repeated many a times for many a days and uh, uh, after some time after some time what uh, uh, did uh, uh, you know uh, uh, what was done by pavlov and which was you know quite you know surprising that at fourth stage uh, pavlov you know eliminate food at random and only bell was uh, rung as a neutral stimulus and even then it was observed that salivation was there and so just on on ringing of bell saliva secretion was observed and uh, and this is what this was basically the completion of the conditioning because the the the, the dog uh, learned uh, uh, to produce saliva just on the presence of bell at this stage you know when bell the neutral stimulus acquires the response of a unconditioned stimulus that is natural stimulus that is salivation then it becomes becomes a conditioned stimulus now the name change nomenclature changes now the neutral stimulus become the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response become the conditioned response and this whole process is basically the process of conditioning and when we use this approach in the teaching and learning of our students in the classroom and the school setup in the home setup when we try to uh, make our children make our students learn something by combining by combining the unlearned uh, uh, unlearned things with something which is already learned in the past when we club together and with the help of that we try to uh, to to create some kind of learning then it becomes you know a pavlovian conditioning learning approach being used in the process of teaching and learning the dog uh, in this experiment had learned an association between the bell and the food and the new behavior had been learned because this response was learned or condition it is called as conditioned response also known as pavlovian response the natural stimulus has now become conditioned stimulus as i already said now in this experiment uh, he, he he means pavlov also gave a law which is called law of temporal con uh, con contiguity pavlov found that for association to be made that is the association between the unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus that is uh, bell and the food so pavlov found that for association to be made the two stimuli had to be presented close together in time if the time between the conditioned stimulus that is bell and the unconditioned you know uh, stimulus that is food is too great then learning will not occur this theory is called classical conditioning because it is the first systematic study of basic laws of learning or conditioning the second reason may be that the conditioning or learning is being done with the help of association of conditioned stimulus with some classical behavior or reflex that is unconditioned stimulus so friends now try to understand the key elements or processes or principles of classical conditioning first of all try to discuss acquisition acquisition is the process of acquiring the natural or unconditioned response by a neutral stimulus that is ns in other words the process of achieving conditioning that is the bond between conditioned stimulus and conditioned response is basically the process of acquisition the speed of condition conditioning depends on a number of factors such as the nature and the strength of both the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus similarly other factors may be the previous experiences and the animal's motivational state uh, also play a very important role in acquisition of some new learning second one is extinction if the conditioned stimulus is presented without the unconditioned stimulus and this process is repeated often enough the cs will eventually stop eliciting a conditioned response means uh, as, as as we have discussed that uh, 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 the the clubbing of you know unconditioned stimulus or food with bell resulted into the salivation uh, salivation the production of saliva saliva so uh, the dog learned to salivate just on the presence of you know bell but when if this you know if this relationship conditioned stimulus and conditioned response are, are are put for a long time for a long time then a time will come when the dog forget to salivate just on the uh, on the on the placement of on the position of on the presence of you know bell only so the, this process of you know forgetting or this process of you know elicitation of 
condition stim stimulus condition response relationship is called extinction so at this point the condition response is said to be extinguished uh, means that the relationship or the bond which was formed between uh, you know neutral stimulus and uh, you know uh, unconditioned response is now broken down it is vanished it is finished and this process is called extinction and uh, now the question is uh, how, how this extinction may be you know rejuvenate or maybe renew so this is another uh, you know key concept in this process which is called reacquisition if the conditioned stimulus is again paired with the unconditioned stimulus a condition response is again acquired but this second acquisition is really happens much faster than the first one next uh, important element is a spontaneous recovery maybe maybe after extinction you uh, are, uh, as a teacher uh, uh, or a master of an animal uh, to whom you are training uh, you may be forgetting uh, 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 forgetting to try for the you know renewal of the extinct uh, behavior an extinguished behavior but uh, uh, the organism automatically some 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 time later on after a gap of time the organism automatically respond uh, and show the previous uh, bond which was formed that is conditioned stimulus and conditioned res response so this is called spontaneous recovery so a spontaneous recovery is defined as the reappearance of a previously extinguished conditioned response after rest period that is if the cs is that is conditioned stimulus is tested at a later time for example an hour or a day or or, or 15 days after you know, after extinction it will again elicit a conditioned response this re this renewed condition res response is usually much weaker than the condition response observed prior to extinction now the next important element is renewal renewal is a uh, re emergence of a conditioned response following extinction when an animal is returned to the environment in which the conditioned response was acquired and it means to say that maybe the teacher or maybe the, the 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 master or the trainer is not trying to do anything but simply because of you know putting the learner or putting the organism in a particular environment the environment elicits uh, the, that particular response which was in a condition uh, a little ago or few of a few days ago and this is so so the renewal is being uh, being you know uh, being automatically revived automatically being done by the organism on their own now we come to the next key element and this is a stimulus generalization a stimulus generalization is said to occur if after a particular condition stimulus a stimulus has come to elicit a condition response a similar test stimulus is found to elicit the same condition response is really the more similar the test stimulus is to the condition stimulus the stronger the cr will be to the test stimulus conversely the more the test stimulus differs from the cs the weaker the cr will be or the more it will differ from that previously observed it means that uh, similar uh, stimulus generalization is basically uh, when the when there is a affinity when there is a similarity in the variety of you know environment in the variety of stimulus so uh, whatever uh, you know bond has been formed between a stimulus and response and if the same kind of stimulus is provided to the organism or provided to the learner it is you know found that uh, the same sort of response is given by the learner so here we can see that the stimulus is generalized by the learner uh, this is basically the concept of stimulus generalization now come to the next you know key element stimulus discrimination one observes a stimulus discrimination when one stimulus that is maybe cs1 elicits one cr that is condition response and another stimulus say as a cs2 elicits another uh, condition response or or no response at all this can be brought about by for example pairing cs1 with an effective us and presenting cs2 with no cs so this is basically uh, the stimulus discrimination uh, the key element in the process of Pavlovian conditioning. The next element is a stimulus substitution theory. According to Pavlov, conditioning does not involve the acquisition of any new behavior, but rather the tendency to respond to old ways to new stimuli. Thus, the theorized, thus uh, Pavlov theorized 
that the conditioned stimulus merely substitute for the unconditioned stimulus in evoking the reflex response. This explanation is called the stimulus substitution theory of conditioning. Now friends, uh, uh, come to the discussion on educational implications of classical conditioning theory. We will try to see how this theory that is Pavlovian conditioning can be implemented, can be applied in our classroom situation and uh, in what uh, way we as a teacher can use this in our classroom the teaching learning process. Uh, so uh, fear, for example, fear, love and hatred towards one or more subjects are created through conditioning. So if you, uh, if you are a good teacher, if you love your students, if you appreciate your students, uh, if you are you know, social to your, uh, uh, your, your class uh, students, uh, if you have good rapport and good and, you know, uh, uh, relationship with, with, with your students, so this particular relationship, your behavior you know, uh, help in developing, uh, uh, you know, uh, developing you know, interest in your subject by those students who are weak in that particular subject. Or, or those who don't like that subject, but, but because of your attitude, because of your behavior, because of your, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, relationship with the students, the students uh, uh, now develop uh, a, a good test of your subject. So this is basically uh, because of the classical conditioning. Uh, so uh, if a science, for, for example, if a science teacher is not competent and skilled in using uh, the effective methods of science teaching, maybe disliked by some of his or her students. If the teacher's behavior is also not satisfactory to students, they may develop fear and hatred towards science in due course of time. So both ways this is possible. You can develop interest, you can develop positive attitude, you can develop, you know, interest towards your subject by putting yourself as a, as a good teacher in front of your students, by putting yourself as a good example for your students, by, by helping your students, by uh, having good relation with your students, by having good ethics with, with your students, you can attract those learners towards your subject and in course of time, they can develop their you know, interest in, in, your, in your subject. And contrary to this, if the teacher uh, is not, you know, uh, is not you know, uh, good in his ethics, if the teacher is not, you know, having good relation with the students in the classroom, the, then maybe that the, uh, many of the students may, in course of time, develop hate and hatred towards that particular subject uh, for which the teacher, you know, uh, is, uh, is 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 showing or reflecting that sort sort of negative behavior to the classroom. Teachers' sympathetic attitude, interesting, joyful, and effective method of teaching may develop desirability and positive attitude toward the subject through the process of conditioning. Use of audio-visual aids in teaching learning process involves the conditional theory as well in making students learn through association. For example, when we teach a child A for apple and at the same time we show the child either real apple or picture of an apple with the word written below the picture. So in the entire process of you know, getting the child learn A for apple, basically the process of conditioning is being used. The child learns the meaning of apple through conditioning process. Conditioning may help in developing desirable habits, interest, attitude, sense of appreciation in other, in the children as well. For example, if a child is not interested in homework, parents and teachers may try to develop positive attitude towards doing homework by associating it with some of his or her likes, such as watching some channel. Maybe the students are or the children are interested to watch, you know, some uh, some of their channel in which they are interested and they are not inter interested in doing homework. So the parents can, you know, uh, can discuss with the child that if you will come, if you will complete your homework, then I will hand over this, you know, remote of the television to you and you can see whatever channel you want to see. So, so, uh, so in, in the first, first instance, the child will try to finish the homework so that they can, they can grab the, you know, uh, remote of the television and can, and can change the channel which is going on in the, in the home and watch their, 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 their interested, you know, channel. Uh, so whatever they like to see and uh, in course of time, uh, they will develop the uh, habit of, you know, doing homework on their own. So by using this kind of, you know, uh, strategy, uh, you can make uh, uh, children learn some habit or develop some skills which 
uh, they were not interested in, 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 in previously uh, again unhealthy attitudes uh, superstition fear and phobia may also be removed through deconditioning for example if a child is having fear from any subject or any object he or she may be made to seek pleasure from it uh, i can share you uh, share with you my personal you know experience during the monitoring of sarf shiksha abhiyan i have been uh, associated with the monitoring of sarf shiksha abhiyan in the states of bihar and uttar pradesh and also rashtriya madhyamik shiksha abhiyan in the states of bihar and, uh, and uttar pradesh in due course of time for almost 8 9 years uh, in one of my visit i was you know visiting some districts in bihar and uh, Uh, for one week i was there in in in, in particular district uh, one day i, I was uh, going to visit uh, schools in a remote area of the district and uh, i was having with me block extension education officer who was deported with me to be there with me for the entire week so in my vehicle i was there uh, block education officer was there and the driver was you know driving the vehicle uh, when we left that uh, town area and uh, we were moving um, on to the road uh, in remote areas uh, at a sudden i saw that a cat crossed the road and uh, as soon as the cat crossed the road the driver also saw that and driver started to slow down the vehicle but i sense the mind and the brain and the feeling of the driver and i uh, he could not stop because of some reason that i was there block education officer was there but he uh, he slowed down the vehicle and was I was basically fearing to cross that that mark from where the cat has crossed but uh, sensing the situation i just called the driver and ordered him to stop the vehicle and when he stopped the vehicle i uh, got down alone and crossed that particular mark alone and from that side i i gave the signal to, to the driver to come now and uh, so the driver took the vehicle to the mark i was standing then i again ride on the vehicle and uh, i travel across that particular block uh, saw different schools and uh, in the evening uh, at around 5 5:30 pm when i reached my hotel uh, where i was staying then i talked to the driver you are okay i am also okay and the block education officer is also okay we all are okay so this is nothing else uh, i mean to say that if uh, this type of you know uh, situation again comes in front of that driver and that that block education officer i am sure that he is not going to stop now so if this kind of situation arises in front of you and this kind of example is there then because of conditioning and some superstition also you know removed from the mind and heart of uh, of, of all of us so conditioning also help in removing the barriers and the superstition and the fear and phobias of different kinds from our minds now friends now uh, let's talk about uh, the critic of uh, you know behavioral uh, theory of learning uh, in general and uh, pavlovian conditioning in particular uh, as we have discussed that uh, behavioral uh, you know theory of learning focused on behavior modification and so uh, it is supposed to be totally a mechanical approach of learning where the students are where the learners are put to you know drill put to exercise a lot to put to practice a lot and because of those practice because of the drill because of the exercise ultimately they develop that kind of you know a skill and they learn uh, through memorization or through cramming and uh, in the entire process you can see that the use of reasoning use of intelligence use of mind use of thinking imaginations are not involved so it is a kind of you know animal learning human should not be treated as machine or animals this is the most important critique of behavioral learning theory approach human intelligence cognitive abilities like reasoning thinking logic and imagination these are the skills which are uh, not given proper place or consideration in behavioral approach of learning as uh, as well as in pavlovian conditioning theory now at last friends uh, we can say that in the entire discussion of deliberation in this particular lecture we have covered behavioral approach of learning where we uh, have found that uh, basically uh, the modification of behavior is 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 is, is, is learning so uh, for any learning there is some change of behavior and the change of behavior is basically enduring in nature pavlov's uh, classical conditioning also uh, find that there is a behavior modification and in the behavior modification basically it is a 
from formation of SR bond, that is a stimulus response bond mechanism, a kind of association is being developed here between the stimulus and response. And so the formation of this bond, this stimulus and response bond, is the for, is the basically process of learning in Pavlovian conditioning approach. And uh, we have also discussed uh, how we can develop good habits, how can we can develop interest among the students. Uh, Toward different subjects and toward different topics, toward different issues of the society, issues of the you know community, towards different functions of the family and the community at large. So through conditioning, we can develop positive attitude among the learners, and at the same time, by using deconditioning, we can eliminate fear and phobias and negative attitude from the personality of the learners. So the major concepts under classical conditioning, that is acquisition, extinction, exponents recovery, and all all other uh, major concepts we have already covered in the discussion and deliberation. We have also discussed the education implication that we as teachers can you know, use the, the power of conditioning theory in our classroom because many things are, you know, many things uh, are basically learned through conditioning. Many things are learned through, you know, cramming by, by students. For example, uh, the value of pi that is 22 by 7 or 3.14 and basically at the school level when the students are studying in class 6 or class 7th or class 8th they are not taught uh, why the value of pi is 22 by 7 they are not taught they are supposed to cram Similarly, when we talk about, you know, mnemonic devices in teaching learning process, the pedagogue teachers, the methodology experts used to uh, teach this in their teaching learning aids, that there is some aid like mnemonic aids, those aids which help in memorizing some facts. For example, we uh, used to uh, tell our students to, to, to cram board mass rule in mathematics. So board mass rule, learning of board mass rule basically, it is a cramming. So students have crammed the board mass rule and this cramming is basically functioning throughout their you know, academic career. So similarly, we, we, we cram, uh, we learn a lot of things through basically conditioning process. And at the same time, our teachers, our parents uh, help uh, us to remove our negative attitudes and negative you know, behavior or fears and phobia by using different type of conditioning. So, uh, uh, critic of the classical conditioning and behavioral approach of learning are a lot, but uh, it cannot be said that uh, classical conditioning or behavioral learning is totally, you know, uh, totally, uh, totally uh, useless. No. So, uh, we, uh, we should understand and personally I feel that as a teacher, I must try to understand the behavioral learning theory as well as the constructivist theory approach. And wherever we need, we find that this particular theory, that is behavioral is more working, we should apply behavioral learning theory. And where uh, we uh, find that constructivist theory is more working, we should apply constructive, constructive theory uh, of, uh, of teaching and learning. And when both of these are, you know, uh, you can apply, then of course you should apply constructivist approach of teaching and learning so that your students can develop a deeper understanding of the subject you are trying to teach. So, uh, friends, with this, uh, I, uh, I, I, I thank you all and, uh, and uh, wish you to see, see, see you in the next presentation. And these are the references uh, which have been consulted uh, in preparation of this entire presentation. Thank you so much. You are watching the module number 22nd of uh, this particular course, which was based on behavioral learning theories. This was the first lecture, which was on Pavlov's learning theory. This video lecture was recorded by faculty at home during the national lockdown period for COVID-19 pandemic using minimal technical resources. Technical errors, if any, are unintentional and may please be ignored. For any queries with regard to this lecture or broadcast, kindly send your email to techsupport at dth.ac.in.